Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the, seventh, the Sabbath School Lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series for the months of April, May, and June, I'm sorry, for the months of July, August, and September of uh, 2016, is entitled The Role of the Church in the Community. And this particular lesson is lesson number eight in that series for August 20 of 2016 entitled, Jesus Showed Sympathy. I wonder what that would involve. As usual, we ask you to have your Bible handy. You can look at the verses along with us. We'll try to make that possible. And we also want to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privileges we have of becoming more like you by studying these lessons by learning about you, by learning what you did when you were here on this earth, may we learn to truly show sympathy as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this lesson is going to talk about ways in which Jesus showed sympathy, and it's going to talk about some examples of other people who showed sympathy in interesting ways. We're going to learn that sympathy and compassion and empathy and sometimes pity are words that are pretty much the same in, in many respects. Um, is that an important aspect of Christian experience? Well, what do you think of this story? Um, how much more tragic could it be? A 17-year-old girl struggling with what most 17-year-old girls struggle with, except with so much more, took her own life. Who could imagine the parents' devastation? Their pastor came over to the house. He sat down in the living room next to them and for a long time said nothing. He just immersed himself in their grief. Then he, the pastor, started sobbing. He sobbed until his tears ran dry. Then without saying a word, he got up and left. Sometime later, the father told him how much he appreciated what the pastor had done. He and his wife at that time didn't need words, didn't need promises, didn't need counseling. All they needed right then and there was raw sympathy. I can't tell you, he said to the minister, how much your sympathy meant to us. That's in your Bible study guide, Saturday afternoon, August 13. How does that strike you? Is that an excellent example of sympathy? It's unusual. Unusual, okay. First thing I got out of that was what happened in that family. There's yeah. a whole lot there that's not said that would have contributed to that suicide. Yeah. Do you think Job's friends were sympathetic? Yes. Absolutely. They, they sat for seven days, didn't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they kind of got it, <laughs> got Job ticked off a couple times. Well, when they started talking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they should, maybe they should have gone home after their seven days of silence, huh? <laughs> uh, wow. Well, we're told that Jesus did a lot of mingling. I didn't necessarily use that word, but we know he ming he mingled with a lot of people that the uppity ups in his society didn't think he should be mingling with. His examples of sympathy with those kind of people uh, really brought mingling, brings mingling to a whole new level, doesn't it? Well, what makes, yes, you want to comment? I'm going to share a little story with you. Um, in 93, I had breast cancer, and after that, I have spent a lot of time with various, um, with women who have had breast cancer and sort of walked their journey with them somewhat. And then a number of years, I mean, that was a long time ago, but then mm -hmm. a number of years recently, well, somewhere in there, an extended family member was diagnosed with a very, very aggressive um, type of breast cancer, and it was not looking good at all. And all the family were just sort of walking around on eggshells around her. and. Um, so I went into the hospital to see her and spend some time with her. And because, because I had been there, we just really hit 
the heart, you know, the hard, tough points, mm -hmm. and would, you know, could talk just on such a deep level mm -hmm. because I had been there. Mm -hmm. And I think when I, when I was um, looking over this lesson, I think the reason that Jesus was so able to reach out to people on such a deep level is because he'd been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we know that some of the challenges, and you've sort of hit on a little bit of this, some of the challenges for many of us in the developed world is that our families have become more and more nuclear. In fact, we almost the place where some of families aren't families anymore, there are just a few people who live together in the same building and they're all going in their own directions, doing their own things as fast as they can, and they come home and they collapse into bed, and in the morning they're going first thing in the morning and off they go again. Well, in the old days, it was grandpa and grandma, and mom and dad, and the kids, and, you know, they ate together three meals a day, and, you know, we, it's not like that anymore. So does that make sympathy a lot more difficult? Um, you know, I've noticed in the last few years, I'm not working as much, but I've found that you have communities with which you participate in. And it may not be the same name family, mm -hmm. but I have my work family, I have my girlfriend family, I have my actual blood family. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that is great. You have all the different aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. Even though you're running a hundred different directions, you have a connection. Yeah. Well, think about the people who are out there in the world. You know, we as Christians, we, we, we tie the story of the Bible and so forth, and we see that things, even if things are going badly, we see it heading for a certain kind of end, and we, we believe there's going to be a future and so forth like this. What if you really believe that we, came, we all came from the Big Bang, and we believed in neo-Darwinism, and we're just a little tiny blue marble floating out there in space with no purpose whatsoever, we just happened? How sad. Yeah. Very... Well, uh, even when the children of Israel were in deep trouble, we read about that in places like Judges 2 and 2 Kings 13 and Isaiah 54, God would stand by them even when they had abandoned their loyalty to Him. He still loved them. He took care of them and when they would return to Him, He would bless them and bring them peace. Once again, because of his promise to his, uh, and his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How different that is from the usual Christian understanding of the Old Testament. And what, what is the usual Christian understanding of the Old Testament God? Many people say he's an angry God. He's an angry God, a harsh judge, an unforgiving, stern, mean, uncompassionate, dominant, unforgiving not sympathetic. He's sometimes thought of as arbitrary, vengeful, exacting, unforgiving, even severe. And that's, that's the same God of Jesus. That's Jesus. Yeah. And people just can't understand it. And they have, it come with it uh, naturally because of the way the Old Testament is put together. Mm -hmm. God did this, God did this, God destroyed this. Uh, it's a real serious problem. Well, Many years later, when the northern kingdom was just about at its demise, we read these, ver these verses in Hosea 11. This is about 10 years before the northern kingdom of Israel disappeared into history. We don't even know. We can't trace them after that at all. And God said, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zeboim? My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again. For I am, a, I am God and not a human being. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will not come to you in anger. I mean, I don't know how you can cry out any more you know, sad words than that. Now, some of you may not immediately recognize, but Adma and Zeboim were a couple of small villages located right next to Sodom and they were destroyed with Sodom because of the way uh, same, same reason Sodom was destroyed. 
Look at a couple of other verses that talk about something about God. One in the New Testament, James 5.11. We call them happy because they endured. He's talking about people from before. You have heard of Job's patience, and you know how the Lord provided for him in the end. For the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion. And then look at Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and loving, slow to become angry, and full of constant love. And, of course, I, everyone around this table, I'm sure, recognizes that those words are spoken about God in many places in the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. Just in the last lesson, uh, Jonah, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just knew that you would <laughs> yeah. forgive these people. God, why are you so nice, yeah. right? Yeah. Why are you so nice? Well, Ellen White goes the extra mile and says these words, which I think are absolutely incredible. This would be from Desire of Ages. Uh, I'm sorry, Steps to Christ, page 100. I'm, I was thinking about a f future reference. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. How do you do that? Prayer. In prayer. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5.11. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalms 147, 3. And then this last sentence is absolutely incredible. The relations between God and each soul. What does soul mean there? Person. person. The relationship between God and each person are as distinct and full as though there were not another person or soul upon the earth to share his watch care. Not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Wow. Wow. One of the things that just really caught me um, just recently, um, I'd sort of my 20 years in the wilderness, and when I really started studying and, and coming back to, you know, to really seeking a relationship with God, um, it really hit me that we're all sons and daughters of God. There are no stepchildren, there are no grandchildren, there are no aunts and uncles. It's such a primary relationship. Yeah. One famous pastor that I know of, I'm familiar with, once preached a sermon entitled, God Has No Grandchildren. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look at Matthew 14, 14. How, how does this make you feel? Um, and, and what does it teach us about Jesus? Jesus got out of the boat and when he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity for them, and he healed those who were ill. His heart was filled with pity for them. Um, I think probably the, the saddest parts for Jesus is not those who were sick, because he was about to heal them. What do you suppose was the saddest part for Jesus? People who rejected him, who wouldn't listen to him, who wouldn't open their hearts to him. The pious frauds of the religious leaders of the day caused him a lot of pain. The spiritually blind. Uh, there's a, an incredible story told in, in Luke 7, starting with verse 11. That, let me just read it quickly. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, accompanied by his disciples and a large crowd. Now, if you look on a map, Nain is about, more or less, halfway between Jesus' hometown of Nazareth and his adopted town of Capernaum. It's up on a, a knoll, and so you have to sort of climb up to get to it. Just as he arrived at the gate of the town, a funeral procession was coming out. Now, do you think Jesus just happened to go to Nain? 
at that moment. At that moment? Or was this planned by, by the father? The dead man was the only son of woman who was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart was filled with pity for her, and he said to her, don't cry. Then he walked over and touched, my version says, the coffin. That's a completely wrong idea because in those days it would be an open beer that was just a, 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 a flat thing like this. The body would be wrapped in, in, in claws and it, it would be carried by probably four men on, on poles. See? And so you can see he walks over there and there's the body lying right there. And when the Lord saw her, he says, then he walked over and touched the, the, the beer, B-I-E-R, and the men carrying it stopped. Jesus said, young man, get up, I tell you. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Try to imagine the emotions that were going on in that couple of hours as it got up to that point, and then an hour after that point. Well, she was a widow, so she had lost her husband previously, and now she'd lost her son, and, and women's position at that time was, mm -hmm. you know, they were dependent. They weren't yeah. independent. Well, you've heard me say this before. We worked in an area in East Africa where a woman is either the daughter of a man or the wife of a man or the mother of a, a son. I mean, you, there's not even a way to address you as an independent woman. You're, you, you have to be related to some male. There's not even a way to talk about you or to address you. My wife's name was Mama Todd, because our son's name was Todd. They never called her by her first name. They didn't even know what her first name was. And that's, that's the way it was in ancient times. Well, the words sympathy, empathy, pity, and compassion have similar meanings. We've talked about that. When we hear of a tragedy, especially if it is in our own local community, do we respond by saying, I'm so sorry, and then just move on? Or do we actually move to do something about it? Have you tried telephoning those who are suffering? Or perhaps sending them a sympathy card? Loving action would be even more appreciated. Fortunately, and, and you know that we actually have groups, and I know some groups around in this area, that when a, a tragedy happens to a family, they would carry food to them uh, and, and, and try to provide assistance of various kinds. I think that's wonderful. Fortunately, in our world today, there are large government-funded aid agencies that deal with natural disasters. And uh, as we speak, there are tornadoes going on right now in, in the Midwest. But what about the smaller uh, misfortunes that are nevertheless affect some people very severely? How should we respond if someone not far from us has his or, home, his or her home burned down or destroyed by a hurricane or a tornado? As we all know, our newspapers and news broadcasts are full of tragedy, tragedies. Uh, you know what the news motto is, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. What does that mean? If someone is hurt or especially if someone's killed, that has to be the number one headline. Why is that? Don't the news people at least get tired of talking about that kind of stuff once in a while? Well, do we think of a few sympathetic thoughts when we hear a story like that and then move on to the sports page? Is that what real Christians should be doing? Well, look at a couple of passages here. Colossians 3, verse 12. First, you are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must, you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay, that's Colossians. Then if we go to uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 8, to conclude, you must all have the same attitude and the same feelings, love one another as brothers and sisters, and be kind and humble with one another. Can we do that? 1 John three seventeen, Rich people who see a brother or sister in need, yet close their hearts against them, cannot claim that they love God. That's pretty harsh, right? 
Is that fair? What do you think? Sure puts it out there, doesn't it? Yeah. Compassion comes from a Latin word, compati, means to really suffer with somebody. If you haven't experienced some very unfortunate event, and Diane, you gave an example, through which we suffered, does it make it easier for us to understand the sufferings of others? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And e even from even though we may, I mean, we, we should feel more natural sympathy for people who've gone through, who are going through something that we've been through, it's often much easier for them to to realize, yeah, they probably do understand my situation because they have been through it. Um, I've, I've, I've had patients. I said, well, yeah, I understand your, your, your problem here. I, well, have you, have you ever smoked? Have you ever drunk alcohol? Have you ever been a drunkard? Well, no. Well, you know, you, the obvious answer is, well, you, you couldn't possibly understand what I'm going through. Uh, that doesn't mean we should all try to become drunkards so we can understand drunkards. But, you know, I really think it, you can very easily look somebody in the eye and say, I've never walked in your shoes. I have never experienced what you're going through right now. But I am very happy to listen. I, I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I, can, I will do what I can. But I, I will never have the same experiences that you've had. Yeah. Yeah. We all know, and, and, and of course you would, you would guess in a, in a series of, lessons like this, we're going to refer repeatedly to the story of the Good Samaritan. Let me just read a few of those verses again. Jesus answered, There was once a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him, stripped him, and beat him up, leaving him half dead. It so happened that a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the man, he walked on by on the other side. Now generally, the priests were of what tribe? Levites. Levites. In the same way, a Levite also came along, went over and looked at the man, and then walked on by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was traveling that way came upon the man, and when he saw him, his heart was filled with pity. He went over to him, poured oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own animal, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him, he told the innkeeper, and when I come back this way, I will pay you whatever else you spend on him. And we discovered uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess it was, that when Jesus told this story, the priest and the Levite who had walked by on the other side were in the crowd as Jesus was telling that story. What do you suppose was going through the minds of those three people as they went by or stopped in, either in, in, the, in the case of the Samaritan? I have a really good excuse for not doing this. I have a really good excuse. I'm in a rush. I have, I have to get to my job in Jerusalem or whatever. Well, it would be some version of this. If I don't help this man, I'm sorry, um, if I help this man, what will happen to me? Will I be late for my job? Could I be attacked by the same robbers? What would happen to me if I tried to help this man? By contrast, what is a Samaritan asking himself? If I don't help this man, what will happen to him? Very different question. Ellen White goes way beyond that when she says in Review and Herald, January 1, 1895, and in Welfare Ministry 47.1, these words, the Levite was of the same tribe as was the wounded, bruised sufferer. So the guy who was lying in the ditch was a Levite. So the priest and Levite passed by relative. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not a real close relative, but that's right. And they were going down the road, so they would not have been going to serve at the temple. Do we know for sure that they were going down the road? Well, it says that the, uh, by, by chance a priest was going down on that road. I see, going down. It doesn't say whether yeah. the Levite, he just came to that point, so. Yeah. Okay. So it was even more relevant when Jesus asked, who is the neighbor? Yep. 
Oh, when it's really of your own tribe? Yeah. Well, and you know the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son, the father is represented as a correct picture of God, as he welcomes the sinner back, as God welcomes sinners back home. The prodigal was, think about his story, wasteful, reckless, extravagant, uncontrolled as he ran away from home and wasted his father's money. But when he came back, the father's love was wasteful, extravagant, uncontrolled, but to the older brother, the father was the prodigal. Think about that. Prodigal because of what? What was it that the older son thought was wrong with the father's attitude? He's wasteful. Wasting my money. Mm -hmm. So what does it take to convince us to set, a self, set self aside and become vulnerable to those in need? Conversion. Conversion, wow. It didn't have to be quite so blunt. <laughs> That's what popped into my head. So. Yeah. Some of us live near cities which can be dangerous places. Are we willing to reach out to people in such places who are hurting? Would God protect us if we did that? Diane, do you ever feel endangered where, where you are? On Monday, I went with some of my students to, um, who were making a home visit over in San Bernardino. And, um, you know, they needed to have me along. I needed to observe their, their skills and all that. Two days later, within two blocks of that, that location, there was a murder. Oh, boy. I will tell you an interesting story in my particular case. Um, we, we took over a clinic that used to belong to the Air Force. And in the days when the Air Force was there, there was a huge high, I think 10 or 8 or 10 feet high, chain link fence, fence all the way around the property. Of course, you know, this was a military base. They didn't want people getting in there and doing all sorts of crazy things. So when we got there, we had to literally cut a place in the, ch in the chain link fence. And then we at, in the beginning, we, we turned that piece into a sliding gate that would go back and forth, and we would lock it up at night and so forth. And there were a lot of people who thought, even though it's only three miles from Loma, from Loma University Medical Center here, uh, that thought it was way too dangerous to go over there. Um, we had some heads of departments come down there and said, well, I'm, I'm not sure where our students should come down here. This is not a very safe place. Well, 20 years have gone by. We've had a couple people have their car stolen, so it's not, you know, some things have happened there, but no one has been damaged. No, no one's been seriously hurt. Um, is God protecting us? I would think Are so. we just lucky? No, I don't think it's luck. Mm -hmm. I think the protector has a lot more involvement. When you read uh, Ephesians six twelve, mm -hmm. and uh, First Peter five eight, yep. eight through ten, and I, I just noticed there was nothing in here about John the Baptist. Or I don't think you have anything in there about John the Baptist in this no. le in this lesson. This lesson no. But uh, uh, you read First uh, Peter five ten. Yeah. I mean that is. It that doesn't. goes it, back about as a roaring lion. And it well and and ten. It, nobody gets, it doesn't say everybody gets out of this place without some suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, the Creator was here 2,000 years ago and suffered at the hands of His creatures. I so. will. Talking about the roaring lion thing, I don't know how, you, how many of you happened to see, but in the last few days there was a, I think it was maybe even yesterday, there was a couple that were camping in a tent, a thin nylon tent in one of the big game parks in Africa, and there had been some rain, and it had been really dry, and now there was some rain, and there was, rain was, raindrops were collected on the, on the side of the tent. And these people have video of the lions coming up and licking the water off of the side of their yeah. tent. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 
be grateful that's all they licked. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Well, we read in John 11:35 that Jesus wept, and of course, children love to. I remember I told my children, my grandchildren, "Okay, I'll give you 50 cents for every every verse of the Bible you memorize and repeat to me." Well, of course, you know immediately <laughs> they, they the go to one. the shortest verse in the Bible. Why did Jesus weep? I think the sadness was more than just the death because he knew what was coming but I think that maybe he was weeping for a lot more than that a lot of other people who would die and and people that would not be raised again people who die with no hope remember that in the sequence here the, the Pharisees had been trying to oppose Jesus almost from day one but the Sadducees had sort of kept themselves a little bit aloof. They didn't like what Jesus was doing, but they didn't concern themselves a whole lot. But remember, the Sadducees believed that it's impossible to come back to life after you're dead. And there's no life beyond this life. There are no angels. They didn't believe in angels, nothing like that. And here Jesus comes right just a very short distance from, from Jerusalem with many, who, there were probably hundreds of people there because this is a famous family, probably Pharisees. And, you know, may, well, I, anyway, I won't go into all the reasons why I think that, but probably um, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were, belonged to a Pharisee family. Lots and lots of people there. And Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and all of a sudden, the Sadducees say, if this guy keeps doing this kind of stuff, Everything we have tried to promote has gone out the window. Well, didn't they try to pl they plot to try to kill Lazarus? Yes. Okay. After he was raised from the raised from the dead. Yeah. Then they then they direct more directly against Jesus, and the Caiaphas says, "Hey, the word gets out about him; the whole world's going to follow after him." Yep. And they weren't saying praise the Lord. What they were saying is, "We're going to be out of business." Yeah. I I wonder what would have happened if he would have raised a Sadducee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's an interesting thought. Well, to understand exactly why he was weeping, the Desire of Ages quote that I w sort of had in my mind earlier, page 534, paragraph 2 says this, Jesus wept because the weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. He saw that in the history of the world, beginning with the death of Abel, the conflict between good and evil had been unceasing. Looking down the years to come, he saw the suffering and sorrow, tears and death that were to be the lot of men and women. I added the women. His heart was pierced with the pain of the human family of all ages and in all lands. The woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul, and the fountain of his tears was broken up as he longed to relieve all their distress. Wow. Try to imagine it. I mean, I recently had a, a friend that I have known since he was a little boy um, died running out on the hills. We don't even know for sure why he died. And it was very sad. And, you know, but try to imagine someone like Jesus who's not just Here's, here's one of his fr close, fr closest friends dies. Now he's about ready to raise him to life again. That we understand that. But he, in, in that instance, he's, he's seeing every tragedy that has ever happened in every part of the world, in every generation. Overwhelming. Hmm. General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, said, if you can't cry over the city, we can't use you. What do you suppose he was meaning by that? No heart. If you, if you don't have sympathy for the people in, the biggest, in greatest need, you know, go somewhere else. We, we can't use you. Well, try to imagine... If you want, read 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Well, maybe I should just go ahead and read it. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4. Let us give thanks to, the, to God and Father of our Lord Jesus 
the merciful Father, the God from whom all help comes. He helps us in all our troubles so that we are able to help others who have all kinds of troubles using the same help that we ourselves have received from God. Now, what help did Jesus provide us after when he, when he returned to heaven? Who do you say was going to leave behind? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? So now imagine this situation now for a moment. What would it be like if you're suffering and you're, you're struggling with or, or you're, you're trying to sympathize with someone to have, imagine the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit huddled around you bringing comfort and cheer. Or perhaps they're in tears with you. Mm -hmm. One of my very, very favorite um, verses of the Bible is in Romans 8. And um, when things are really, really bad, sometimes people, myself and maybe others too, you can hardly put together the words. And um, so then in verse 26, 27, I'm in the, me in the message, so I don't know where the fine. they are. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. Yeah. That's just so powerful. Mm -hmm. See, my computer here has all of a sudden died, decided to expand beyond the edges of the page, and I'm not. Let's do this. Give me just a moment, folks. See if I can make it do better. About the same thing. Would you like a hard copy? Well, no, I can read it. It's just that. Anyway, let's let we'll move on. The word comfort comes from the Latin com, together with plus fortis strong. When we suffer some tragedy, do that. Um, does that strengthen us and encourage us to reach out to others who are suffering? And and you gave a perfect example back earlier. What would happen if Adventist churches became houses of refuge for the hurting? That really should be our goal and our purpose. Mm -hmm. My nephew and his wife um, live in the Boulder, um, Colorado area, and they put to their church, their, their Adventist church there, got together with a number of the other churches over the winter when, when they were having some really, really cold times. Mm -hmm. And um, various days of the week, churches would be open for people to come in and sleep on the pews. Mm -hmm. that's, that's some of the you know, rubber meets the road kind yeah. of things that, that we can do to reach out to people. Well, in our Bible study guide for August 18, it suggests that some of these things that we should do to, to show sympathy. Be authentic. Listen more than you speak. Be sure your body language reinforces your attempt to sympathize and comfort. Show sympathy out of your individual personality. Some people give sympathy by quietly crying with a troubled person. Others don't cry but show sympathy by organizing something that is a comfort to the bereaved. Being a presence is often more important than speaking or doing. Allow people to grieve in their own way. Become acquainted with the stages of, pro of processing grief that people often go through. And of course, social workers are famous for that and, and we could learn a lot from them. Um, be careful about saying, I know how you feel. Chances are you don't. There's a place for professional counseling. And I fortunately am very, very lucky because I work with professional counselors every day. So when I need to refer a patient, they're there. Don't say, I'll pray for you, unless you really intend to do so. When possible, pray with, unhurriedly, visit with, and share encouraging Bible promises with suffering ones. Organize support groups if available at your church or in your community. 
Jesus did some amazing, did some miracles, miraculous and amazing things to show how much he cared. He imagined feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and then later 4,000 men, not counting women and children. And, the, and in the latter group, they were mostly Gentiles. Would that matter? Should that matter? It was more shocking to the Jews that he would, to his disciples, very specifically. Yeah. yeah. They could somehow understand how he could do that for Jews, but to do that for Gentiles? Yeah. What's wrong, Jesus? Let me see if I can, I don't know if I, I'm still having a little trouble with my computer here, but it's still misbehaving. Can you do it where it goes like from one, 150% to 100% or like that? Not in this program, I don't think. I was trying to do that before. Anyway, let's move on. Well, when we do a small deed of helpfulness for someone uh, who is hurting, does it sometimes seem like it is so little when the need is so, is so much? We may feed the hungry for a meal, but in a few hours they're hungry again. If you start to think about the need in the entire world, it might tempt us to ask, what's the sense of doing anything? But what if everyone said that? Then no one would be helped. On the other hand, if everyone uh, who saw the need did something, how many would be helped? We know that the Bible makes it clear that there will, be, there will always be the poor and needy, those who need help, those who are suffering, whether from pain or some type of illness. But Jesus said that when we reach out to them with a glass of water or provide them a meal or some, something, some clothing, we are, in effect, doing it for him. And you remember the passage in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Dwight Nelson, the pastor of the Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews University, in his book Pursuing the Passion of Jesus, said, Many wonder why God doesn't act. God wonders why so many of his people don't care. Does that say anything? Is that a fair question? Maybe we shouldn't even talk about questions like that. Well, kind words simply spoken, little attention simply bestowed, will sweep away the clouds of temptation and doubt that gather over the soul. The true heart expression of Christ-like sympathy, given in simplicity, has power to open the door of hearts that need the simple, dedicated touch of the Spirit of Christ. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, page 30. As we noted in the story at the beginning of this lesson, even the simplest act of true compassion and sympathy may make a huge difference to someone who's hurting. How often have you experienced the joy of showing unselfish kindness and sympathy to someone who's hurting or hungry or suffering? Uh, and Diane, I keep picking on you, but do you feel it's a real hardship to go down and spend time at the station? You know, I have so much of a commitment. Um, you know, I was a public health nurse for many, many years. I've been teaching, you know, public health nursing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I was raised in a family that had a very godly attitude about outreach and responsibility to people. Mm -hmm. um, I. It just brings me so much joy because as the way we have our little system set up, um, they push their hands, they come on in. I'm the first person they see and I'm serving oatmeal. And I make really great oatmeal with apple, part apple juice and cinnamon and nutmeg in it. And it's well, I think just, I better come down. Oh, there. it's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I always make it a point to greet people, to smile with them. How are you doing today? Um, you know. Somebody came through with a um, San Francisco um, 49er shirt or hat, something like that. So I was talking to him. He said, oh, it's just a hat. It's not, you know, but you stop and talk to people just, just a little bit of time mm -hmm. you know, while you're serving up the oatmeal. And um, to watch their faces start to light up, mm -hmm. um, when, they, when they are developing a sense of family, and they wa are starting to watch out for each other. They pay attention to each other. Um, we have a lot of people that come and, you know, we see them a few times and not so many. Um, um, 
Today we served about just under 50, but Monday we had 70. Mm. I mean, this is a lot of people that are coming mm. through, a lot of hungry people. And um, to, to put some kind of a welcome to them, and then um, one of the people, you know, we always have a prayer with them. Um, you know, partway through the meal, we just, you know, sort of everything stops and, and there's a bit of a prayer. Some of them we, we will prob probably never touch, but every morning uh -huh. our prayer is, let us be your hands, let us be your mouth, let us be your heart, mm -hmm. you know, to reach out to some of these people. Well, you know, it, mm -hmm. it sounds like this whole lesson here, we're talking about sympathy, and it sounds like they're training us to go down into their depths so we can start mm -hmm. being, feeling terrible like they're feeling, and so that we can feel sympathy that way. Um, I don't know. Sometimes it needs to be the other way around. You need to go in with a positive attitude and mm -hmm. saying that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Come on, guys. It's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, here well, we are practicing the sympathy stuff, and I was sitting here thinking, what, what are we developing here? Uh, we're going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. when, when, how are we going to use that in heaven yeah. type of thing? Well, and, 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 and it just, it just, it just seems to me like, um, like we're off this side of the, we're not really balanced here, mm -hmm. dealing with this sympathy business. Jesus said you have to meet people where they are. Well, that's true, but mm -hmm. how do you do that? Do you go down to the depths that they're at and say, oh, Wherever I'm so are. sorry. Oh, man, I just feel terrible with you. I am going to take you on on that one. <laughs> I, think, I think what we've got here is long overdue. We as a church have run overseas missions, the Pacific, wherever. We have never, almost never focused on people in the gutter. Mm -hmm. And I've seen uh, a friend and I both came from training in Australia, and uh, he, we both worked the same place. And the management was going to open... Uh, in, in downtown LA, a clinic for alcoholics. And, but it wasn't the street alcoholics that got it, it was the businessmen. But, but how we've do you always deal? been doing in that kind of thing, and it's time we woke up that there are people that really are hurting. We need to reach everybody we possibly can. But how do we, how do, we do that by jumping into the gutter with them? Try, try, oh, you don't not, have to. It sympathy. sounds like we are. But sympathy is not bringing ourselves down there. It's not well, as, a, as, a, we were as saying, opposed to... You know, we no, feel yeah, exactly yeah. what no, they're no. like. No, and we're so, just not condemning them. In other words, so, sympathy as opposed to condemnation so that we uh, can... That we don't condemn them. It's what would happen? Right. Let, let me make a suggestion. What would happen if all 6,000 members of the University Church here at Loma Linda said, we're all going to do what Diane does one day this week. Well, we're talking about sympathy. We're not talking about call for, for uh, action here. I'm calling, I'm calling for action. And when you call for action, how are, what is going to be your plan? It's, are you going to go there and, and say, well, let's put a frown on our face and be really no. sympathetic? Diane was people. just telling you that she smiles and she... I, nice, those people. It's, I take it as a personal challenge that by the time they're standing there with their oatmeal, moving on to the next thing, they have a smile on their face, they have been greeted, they have been welcomed, and to brighten up their day. I will also tell you that um, a year ago when we were doing this, nobody ever said thank you. They just sort of came through, came through, came through. I cannot tell you how many people are now saying, Thank you for being here. Thank you for being consistent. Thank mm -hmm. you for this. God bless you. We are so grateful to have you down he mm -hmm. here at the station helping out. What are the things, we'll pick up Gary's story here a little bit, what are the things that make us unsympathetic toward others? It's their fault. Difference isn't, what? It's their fault. Oh, yeah. yeah obviously it's In their fault. There was a condemnation but, but, angle. Yeah, well, but just think about some things. There are some genuine things that make it a little difficult. Language, mm -hmm. differences in culture. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it's hard to reach across those things. Certain kinds of illnesses are a little bit scary. 
uh, racial differences, even poverty in some cases. In my, there was a man right in front of me in my jury duty today that was just about as filthy as you can be. And you know, you don't just naturally want to go up with somebody like that and put your arm around him and say, how are you today, you know? What do you do? That was his way to get out of jury duty. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. To me, it's, it, it, it's, it's the, it would be a current, a, a modern version of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. We do what the Samaritan did then. It's, you don't have to get down and grovel with them. Well, here, here's the question. What do the people in this community think of our church? If they even know it's there. We have a very large populous church not far from us called The Rock. Mm -hmm. And they go out, they send buses out and collect people and bring them to church, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you conducted a survey in this, er, this area here and you asked people which church they would prefer to go to, how would they compare the Seventh-day Adventist church, a large church here? with the rock, do you think? I can tell you if I was over on the west side of San Bernardino and I was thinking about where would I fit in, where would I be comfortable, yeah. this is the one that gives me the ride, this is the one that I listen to the sermon, they sure. feed me, mm -hmm. I'd, yeah. I'd vote the rock every time. Are there people around us who are tired and lonely and discouraged? More than you realize. How can we reach out to them? Some Christians feel like they need to do some great thing as their mission. Look what I've done out here. They feel they're required to do some be something because they're told to witness or maybe even because we are trying to baptize more members. Christ calls us to a higher motivation. Love, sympathy, compassion for people. And... Here's a, vo a passage we've looked at a number of times. That it's appropriate, I think, here. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation, merely, because he's required to do so, I mean, it says we've got, we got a witness, right? Will never enter into the joy of obedience. In fact, he does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, the bottom and the top of page 98. How do we, how do we encourage people to do that? Well, in our in our in our busy, hectic world, we're always looking for ways to do it quicker, do it faster, get it done. Um, we know that there are social networking sites, and I'm not an expert on those, so I'll let some of the rest of you comment about this. Facebook is the world's largest online social networking site. And they have a thumbs up or a thumbs down option. I understand there's some other options available these days. What are some of them? I love it. Um, a surprise, a wow, tears. Um, what little, else? Little faces, emojis. Yes. They're little always, emojis. Yeah, yeah. things that. Uh, so uh, the tear one would be appropriate for sympathy, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Is a person who is a personal touch essential to real sympathy? When we tell someone who's in the midst of a tragedy that we will be praying for him or her, or her do we really do so? I can do it right there. That would be best. Um, we read this once before, but look at this verse, Matthew 14, verse 14. Jesus got out of the boat, and when he saw the large crowd, his heart was filled with pity. For them and he made and he healed those who were ill now there's a very interesting thing that we we miss because we don't read the original languages 
The word compassion in this verse, or he had pity for them, is translated from the Greek word splunknistes, is the way it is in Greek, which William Barclay describes as the strongest word for pity in the Greek language. He points out that it derives from the word splunkna. Gordon, you're a good medical doctor. What's splunkna? The bowels. <laughs> it means the bowels. According to Barclay, it describes the compassion which moves a man to the deepest depths of his being. In the Gospels, apart from its use in some of the parables, it is used only of Jesus. The Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 108. Why do you suppose that is? Only of Jesus. The word, the, the strongest word for sympathy is used only of Jesus. We, we, we've, we, we've studied how Jesus reached out to the Roman centurion. Did the Roman centurion have any sympathy for Jesus? I think he did. Hmm. Why would you say that? Because of his comments after his death. Mm -hmm. He recognized the Jewish rules and so forth like this. He'd helped them build a synagogue. Uh, and he realized that maybe Jesus wasn't even supposed to come to his house. So he said, you don't, you don't have to come to my house, just speak the word. Sometimes I think we overlook that, that part of the story. Um, the men who brought the paralyzed man with, on, on, on his cot. Here they are up there. They're at Peter's house. They're tearing the roof apart. They're lowering the man down. What do you suppose they were thinking just about that point in time? What do you think the man on the bench, uh, on the lying on the thing, here he is, whoa, <laughs> right in front of Jesus. Do you think he was a little concerned? Was he, um, how did Jesus respond to his need? I forgive your sins. Courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. I mean, how could you, Jesus dropped whatever he was doing. Courage, my son, your sins are forgiven. And we could go on. There are many stories in the Gospels about how Jesus reached out to people in difficult situations. Could we do the same? Our wonderful Father, the example you left for us 2,000 years ago is almost beyond belief. You reached out in so many ways to so many people in so many different difficult situations. We wonder, I mean, it's, it's hard for us. We have a hard time reaching out even to one person in one situation. You did it to so many. Help us to have our hearts moved in pity when we see difficult situations. To be willing to put our arms around people who need a little tenderness, even if they're homeless. And Lord, Show us ways in which we can show your love to others on a day-by-day -day basis is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.